I think one of the best benefits of PC gaming is the unending library of games you have access to. You've got emulation, games from across the world, indie, AAA, and tens of thousands of games on Steam. And at least a dozen of them aren't porn. In recent years, the PC has become the first destination of free-to-play games outside your pocket. This is for better and for worse. There's some really fun free-to-play games out there, but let's be real for a moment. All of them, to some extent, are predatory. We've long since entered the era of calling $20 a microtransaction. If you look hard, you can find some games for free. No strings attached. I'm looking really hard personally because the six games you see here went through a lot of vetting. Here's the criteria I set out for myself for these six free games. If you don't care that much, use the timestamps to skip ahead. Number one, no money spent without question. No microtransactions, no battle passes, no FOMO, no anything. You do not have the ability to spend money on these games. It isn't happening. You cannot be nickel and dimed here. You can't get addicted to the purchases. These are full games with absolutely zero cent cost. Number two, no piracy. Um, duh. I don't really care about piracy, but I also don't think you should have to sail the high seas to play some good games. Number three, no horror games. I'll be real, the vast majority of actually free games on the internet are short horror games. They're relatively easy to make, and they get a lot of YouTube traction. If you want free horror games, just download whatever's on the front page of itch.io right now. Not Poop Killer, though. That costs a dollar. Number four, no mods. If it requires purchasing some other game first, I'm not including it here. Number five, no Doom mods. I've spoken before about how Free Doom effectively makes most Doom mods 100% free, but I like to keep the Doom stuff Doom videos. Number six, no accounts. I'll be honest, this wasn't really a rule. I just noticed that none of these games require making an account for anything, and I think that's pretty cool. Number seven, no demos. Full games only. Maybe the game is in development, but no demos of full games. This list is in no particular order. Let's start with a short and easy one. Princess Remedy in a World of Hurt is a simple ZX Spectrum graphic-like shoot-em-up in a fantasy world. You are the titular Princess Remedy, sent down from Saturn to heal the people of Hurtland. A world of hurt, if you will. Just about everyone, and even some things, you come across will need a doctor's touch. There are very light RPG elements, some decent music, and overall just a nice and kind of cute atmosphere. This is the kind of game you download, crack open a glass soda, play it one weekend morning, get it done in an hour, then move on to the rest of your day. It's not too hard, but not too easy. The stakes aren't that high. It looks like an old Ultima game, but plays like baby's first Toho. Princess Remedy in a World of Hurt was released in 2014 for a game jam by Swedish dev team Ludosity. You can acquire it from the website description or from Steam. Two years after the game came out, a follow-up called Princess Remedy in a Heap of Trouble released that is similar but expanded. It's $5, and I'd recommend it if you like this. A few of you may have recognized Princess Remedy, but just couldn't remember from where. She appears in Slap City, a crossover platform fighter by Ludosity that includes characters from many of their games. Slap City turned into a bit of a sleeper hit that landed Ludosity a job making Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. I hear ya. One hour? That's it? Okay, let's jump in the other direction. A free game with similar graphics that you could play forever. Dread it, run from it, Dwarf Fortress arrives all the same. Undoubtedly one of the most influential games of the modern era, and it still hasn't left Alpha. I think everyone has heard of Dwarf Fortress, but it is truly a horrifying game. It isn't a horror game, no, not at all, but it is intimidating. Anytime you hear someone discuss Dwarf Fortress, they tend to describe the most crazy cascades of events while showing you footage of light bright ASCII art. For the sake of this video, I finally took the plunge, and let me tell you, once you get used to the hotkeys, it isn't completely hell, other than the crashing. I feel like I've said a lot, but not really described what Dwarf Fortress is. It's because Dwarf Fortress is very hard to explain. To be extremely reductive, Dwarf Fortress is primarily a settlement survival game. If you've played RimWorld, or Going Medieval, or Timberborn, or literally the game called Settlement Survival, you have a rough idea of the main gameplay loop of Dwarf Fortress. You build a settlement, and you try to keep it alive. There is no real winning in Dwarf Fortress. Like, there is literally no goal other to see how long you can last. To quote the community mantra, 
losing is fun. To be honest with you, the best sales pitch I can give for this game comes not from video games, but from the table. Ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Pathfinder, maybe? You know how basically anything is possible because the visuals are in your party's collective imagination and the vocabulary of the DM? It's like that. Dwarf Fortress has such shit graphics because only two guys worked on this and they're much more interested in generating a realistic planet and a novel's worth of backstory over user amenities. I'm not an expert at this game by a long shot, but I'm starting to feel like that guy in the Matrix who sees through the code and pictures like a ham sandwich or whatever. To be fair, I need a graphic pack to get that far. I still don't mostly get this game though, it really does take time, time that would make me delay this video by at least a month. If Dwarf Fortress has any issue, it's limited mouse support. The UI is rough too. If you've got the cash, in a few months a graphically enhanced version of Dwarf Fortress is supposed to release on Steam that should fix those issues. I'm personally really excited for it. The proceeds are directly going to pay for the creator's medical bills too, so if there's any game worth your cash, this would be it. Oh, Dwarf Fortress, real original. Thanks man, haven't heard of that one before. Okay then, you want something different? Here you go. Crypt Worlds, your darkest desires come true. Crypt Worlds, and I'm not saying the full title again, is a freeware first-person adventure game from 2013 created by Cicada Marionette, or Lilith, or Elizabeth Deadman, or all, or just one. Crypt Worlds is very, very weird, but it has a remarkably simple premise. The creator of the Crypt Realm, Goddess Moronia, has been rendered powerless because of the evil Dendigar. Dendigar is threatening to destroy the world, and even worse, the God of Chaos has started to stir as well. You are tasked to collect the five goddess relics within 50 days to restore Moronia's power and stop Dendigar and Chaos from destroying everything. Nothing makes sense from here on out. Like, how do I even explain this? You are a... you. Dendigar is down a hallway from the goddess. I accidentally made everyone cowboys, underground McDonald's, talking coffins, Dendigar is the mascot for a bootleg Russian NES, Mule, you primarily interact with the world by pissing. Winners don't do drugs. Crypt Worlds is a quiet madness when you're playing it. It's just lucid enough for you to know you aren't dealing with a Terry A. Davis situation, but I wouldn't be shocked if some LSD was involved. There's references to Pokemon and Zelda, the game isn't actually that hard, it's funny in a weird way, and if you pay enough attention to everything, there is a sort of logic to it. While I wouldn't call Crypt Worlds a fantastic game, it's very unique. When you play it, you get to live in the extreme micro-niche of a vibe its creator wants you to feel. It even comes with some extra material when you download it, like a hand-drawn guide and a short film made in Unity called Horrible Screaming Murderer 4 Season of the Witch. A VHS of the movie is centered to a quest in the game. Long story short, give it a try. If it's your first time, it'll probably take like 2-3 to three hours to beat it. Although repeat playthroughs will be dramatically quicker. I've told you too much already, it's time to save the Crypt Realm. And piss on everything. Crypt Worlds was basically a one-woman project by Lily Zone, other than some music by Zoe Sparks. There's a sequel to Crypt Worlds in development called Crypt Underworlds. I should know. I kickstarted it. It's still not out, and it's been two years since the last demo. Thankfully, Lily hasn't been silent. She recently won the Nuovo Award at the 2022 IGF Awards for Memory Card, a collection of Unity things you can download. Would you believe it beat Cruelty Squad for that honor? Now, what if you'd like to play a more traditional first-person game? Oh boy, Marathon is a 1994 first-person shooter released for the Macintosh, and with the help of the Alif 1 source port, you can easily play it on modern Windows. Recognize this logo? Before Halo evolved combat, Bungie responded to Doom with Marathon. They may not be the best comparison, Marathon is like the Neanderthal of shooters in the sense of it being a different evolutionary line that would eventually merge with the mainstream shooter genus. Marathon was released almost one year to the day of the original Doom, in an era where there weren't even many Doom clones made yet. In contrast to Doom and many Doom-like games to come, it has a real story. You are not a space marine. As far as you know, you are but only a security guard. Unfortunately for you, the large ship you're on, the titular Marathon, is being invaded by QuickTime's finest aliens. Even worse, something is up with the AIs on the ship, and even, even worse, they're the only contacts you really have throughout the game. The cramped corridors, surprise aliens, and crazy AI make this game feel like a precursor to System Shock. This is no immersive sim, though. Despite all I just said, this is still truly a boomer shooter. 
There's a lot of cannon fodder out there, and they're just looking to be gunned down. I'm gonna warn you now, we're taking an unusual U-turn into the settings menu. Alif 1's default mouse controls are some of the most unwieldy and shit-feeling excuses for an input system I've ever seen. Go there first with this game. What you see on screen is as close as I could get to a modern-feeling FPS mouse feel. But if nothing else, you must turn off the auto-return-to-center setting. I get that this is an old game with modern sensibilities crowbarred in, but good lord, that one setting is the single most infuriating in all of video games. So, uh, let's talk about the gameplay now that your mouse works. Marathon gives you a pretty chunky pistol, but quirk number one, it needs to reload and you can't do it manually. I guess Duke did that too. The aliens you're gonna be fighting are, in my opinion, kinda silly looking. There's just something so Macintosh about how they're colored. A lot of the sound effects are super stock too. When I was a little kid, our computer lab had those Y2K iMacs with like a 1996 version of Macintosh, so I strongly associate the Macintosh vibe with kids entertainment. Might just be me. Also, you sure you got those mouse settings right? No? Okay, might as well check the menu. Oops, quirk number two, there's no pause menu. You just quit the mission. Should have saved beforehand, psych. Quirk number three, you can't save anywhere you want. There's these save stations in game you have to use, and if you die in the next mission before finding one, you will get sent back to the previous mission. Marathon is weird, but experiencing the quirks are part of the experience. With enough time, you acclimate to its way of thinking. I know I've said some negative things already, but with Aleph 1, I do genuinely recommend you to play Marathon 2. Okay, so Marathon is pretty cool, but the level design in some of the later stages will make you feral. Thankfully, Marathon 2 is free as well, and a lot less frustrating. It isn't a drastically different game, but it does generally feel like a tighter experience with much more interesting environments. Marathon 2 Durandal now takes place on an alien world instead of a human starship, and I find it a genuinely fun-looking place. Want more variety? How about Marathon Infinity? Infinity stands out by having an experimental plot and having even more level design variety. Ultimately, all three Marathon games generally feel quite similar, but if I could only recommend one, it would be Marathon 2 Durandal. They're all a little quirky, but also all very interesting. Technically, this list now includes eight games, too, so I hope that makes it up for those of you who weren't interested in Crypt Worlds. Three for the price of none. Now let's leave the first-person perspective and start looking down like a god. A god of transport, that is. Open TTD is an open-source remake of Chris Sawyer's Transport Tycoon Deluxe. You may recognize the work of Chris Sawyer, as he was a creator of the much more popular Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 and the graphical style similarities between the two are very notable. That game similarly has an expanded open source port, however, that game requires you to own the original, while this one does not. At first view, Open TTD feels daunting in the same way that Dwarf Fortress does. There are simply too many options. And look at this, I've got like 10 cameras open now. The reality is actually a bit more simple. In Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe, you are a transport tycoon. Your job is to create a transportation company that makes bank and sends the most stuff from X to Y, to Z, to A, to B, till you get it. I'm linking a fantastic tutorial that shows you the basics, enough to make sure your income is higher than your costs, which in a sandbox game like this is really the only goal. You will build buses, roads, airports, trains, tracks, and spend a long time doing it. This is another eternal game if you set your mind to it. OpenTTD is defined by its community. It's been around since 2004 and there are innumerable mods for it. From graphic packs to AI automation to a realistic recreation of the entire state of Massachusetts to the original Doom soundtrack. Just about everything regarding the experience can be modified in some way. I only scratched the surface on this one. As with Dwarf Fortress, this is a game that needs a patient mind. But it certainly isn't as stressful as that game. It's calming. It's like Euro Truck Simulator for people who like spreadsheets. Put on a podcast and decompress with this one. I would also highly recommend downloading OpenTTD Manager to keep it updated. There's a lot of links in the description for this video, and a download for that is included. Now, if you want something a bit more action-focused, why not Cave Story? Did you know that Cave Story is free? Seriously. Cave Story is a game that if you haven't played, you really need to play it now. Cave Story is an integral puzzle piece in the world of indie game design. Originally released in 2004, Cave Story, or Dogutsu Monogatari, is a Japanese independent Metroidvania game. This is really special because it predates the craze of, like, 
every other indie game being a Metroidvania or roguelike Metroidvania? If Cave Story is anything, it is focused. Developed by one man, it is a deceptively simple game. You're not going to press pause and see 500 stat bonuses to infuse gamer gunk into. Instead, you gain experience per weapon and lose some when you get hurt. You're not going to a hub with many different areas to jump to from the beginning. Instead, Cave Story starts relatively slow. The story is a mystery that reveals itself over time. You don't even get an explanation of who your character is for a good while. It's a pretty good story, told through text, but not so much text as to be boring. Above the surface, there is a mysterious floating island filled with a complicated cave system. You are some guy, waking up with amnesia in one of those caves. Tipped off by the opening cutscene, you're looking for a girl named Sue. That's basically all you know at the beginning of the game. Your main interaction with this world is through the barrel of a gun. Your Polar Star gun starts weak, but at level 3 is fantastic. A number of weapons follow, such as a rocket launcher and a flamethrower. You also get opportunities to trade out your main weapon for something else. Do not do this lightly. That's all the spoilers you're getting out of me. Cave Story isn't super long, but I would hesitate to call it short. It's just right. Just long enough that the weapons don't grow stale. Just long enough for a few secrets to be peppered in, and just long enough to tell a story with a few big reveals. If there's any single word that could describe it, it is tight. Tight as in focused, tight as in cool, and I guess tight because, you know, caves. Cave Story was developed by Daisuke Amaya. Although his gameography is minimal, Daisuke is clearly a fantastic game designer with intricate knowledge on how to make simple games work. Just look up Cave Story Game Design and you'll get a thousand results of video essays and interviews where he proves his knowledge. I have to bring up the fact that Cave Story has been re-released a few times. On PC, there's Cave Story Plus. Frankly, it is generally better than the original, if not drastically changed. It's really Cave Story Remastered, looks and sounds better than the original with some bonus content. But it has a price tag and Cave Story does not. I know I've only really been at it for like two minutes, but I've already talked about it for too long. You need to go play Cave Story. In fact, you should be playing all of these games. These aren't games that are just good because they're free. They're good. Some very important to game history, and since this is the end of the video and you're still watching, that means you're a nerd for this stuff like me, and I can guarantee you'll love at least one of what I talked about. And now, we're ending it there. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.